So let me introduce our moderator today, Ari Beldegran, uh, a UCLA faculty member for the past three decades who's worked tirelessly uh, to put UCLA and the city of Los Angeles on the global biotech scene. He built here in Los Angeles numerous companies. I'll just mention a few. Uh, Agensis, today a part of Estellas. Cougar Biotechnologies, today part of J&J. &J. Kite Pharma, that currently employs uh, almost 2,800 people here in Los Angeles and has produced over a billion dollars in CAR-T products for patient care, all FDA approved. Today, uh, Kite Pharma is a part of Gilead. So Ari is not alone. He's collaborated extensively with many um, past and present UCLA professors and distinguished scientists, among them Owen Witte, Jim Economo, David Chang, uh, Raphael Amada, and Tony Rebus, among many others. So this conference uh, is a great opportunity for us to showcase the power of the academic faculty at UCLA and their capability to transform cutting edge science into innovative and life-sustaining products that really serve our patients, not just here, but globally. So with that, I'll ask uh, Ari to take over and uh, introduce the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, and Dr. Maziaro, thank you for your tireless uh, work on behalf of the uh, Institute of uh, Immunology and Immunotherapy and all your help there. Uh, and uh, soon we'll hear some really great news of how we are moving it to the next uh, level at UCLA. Well, today uh, we have a session on uh, Meet the Leaders. And uh, I think that we have assembled a, quite an amazing group, all of them from uh, California uh, companies. Uh, but before that, I really want to uh, just uh, uh, give a great thank to the TDG uh, for their uh, work uh, in uh, putting all of that uh, group together uh, with Mark Wisniewski and Amir Nyberg and also uh, Mariri Valcourt. All of them are in flooding us every three hours with reminders to uh, not to forget with emails. So uh, good job and uh, great to have all of you here. Uh, before I, I let everybody uh, introduce uh, himself, because you have the names here on the, uh, on the uh, <clears throat> screen, uh, I would just like to say that uh, this group of five members is very unique uh, in uh, California, because three of them are LA-based. So these are companies based in our area. Two are in the Bay Area. So I think that that would be a good uh, introduction discussion on uh, LA as a community, as a growing community for the life science and see how we are being viewed from the uh, outside. At the, same, uh, as the, at the same time, it's interesting that all the five companies are all interested in immunotherapy and engineering the human immune system in different ways. Three companies are taking uh, a path of uh, chimeric antigen re receptor T or CAR T therapy, and two are taking a different but not less uh, important uh, approach with bispecific uh, engagers. And I uh, would love to hear uh, a little bit of a battle uh, of uh, who, uh, who is a winner and who will become eventually the winner, or maybe it will be a combination of the two. Uh, so these are uh, interesting kind of two approaches. In, ad in addition, uh, uh, three of these companies are completely independent, uh, smaller but independent. Uh, s the two others used to be small independent, but one is now part of Roche, the other one uh, of Gilead, but still they may maintain uh, as a subsidiary standalone and be interesting to hear uh, how, how this is being uh, managed. And finally, two of the panelists here are, did their path to a PhD program. Two of them, two others, made it to the MD program. One, actually, David, made you know, MD, PhD. And the fifth is a pure expertise in commercial in the big pharma. 
So that just shows you, and that would be interesting discussion, uh, on how you get to become in, uh, in the C-suite of these uh, companies, there are different directions that one can take, but all of them, you can see, uh, leads to uh, success. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I would like just to uh, start with a brief introduction, maybe each of you, uh, Koki, and uh, you'll go uh, in order, uh, two minutes of uh, introduction. Sure. Thank you, Ari. Uh, my name's Koki. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of Atara. If my phone rings, it's my father calling me because he's a physician and I'm not. He normally calls and says, you worried about getting a job? So <laughs> um, I, it turns out I have a dream job. And um, you know, I grew up in the, the Boston ecosystem. So for me, it's an amazing uh, revelation to be a part of LA. Most of our talent at Atara, all of our talent is from LA, um, from they're either Trojans or Bruins, typically. Um, so I see the excellence day in and day out. And I can tell you um, what got me hooked on cell therapy was uh, when I was at J&J. &J. So this is a bridge to later. Um, I in licensed the Legend program, which at the time was a dark horse BCMA program. And everyone said it was late, it was weird because it was definitely in younger patients, it was from China. That program taught me that there's room for cell therapy even at a company like J&J &J, where we had nothing. We had no capability to make this and I saw the future. Um, so since then, in my career, um, I've worked on CD3 engagers, which I led at Pfizer, um, but now I'm at Atara, and I, I'd be thrilled to tell you more about our program. So we're an EVV T-cell company. We have a phase three asset for post-transplant lymphoma, and we have an amazing program in MS in phase two uh, that I can tell you about, as well as CAR-T. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Christy? Hi, I'm Christy Shaw. I'm the CEO of Kite, uh, really taking on the legacy of the founders of Kite uh, that really brought the science forward for cell therapy, two of them here today, uh, David Chang and obviously Ari. Uh, the goal we have at Kite now is um, to bring that great science to patients around the world, to have outcomes for them to live a longer life and be potentially cured of a devastating disease that they're told they have pretty much six months to live. So that's been um, my humble um, um, honor to be leading this organization. So we are really the undisputed leader in cell therapy right now. And the reason I say that is, as you look at Kite, the unique thing about our, um, our company now is we are the only company that's vertically integrated from research to development to, uh, to commercialization, manufacturing, all within the same company. And that's a huge advantage for us because we then um, can control our destiny in terms of making sure that we reliably deliver patients their cells back 96% of the time, growing globally, growing the pipeline in terms of being able to move this therapy earlier in lines of therapy so patients don't have to suffer through multiple therapies and maybe make it to cell therapy, but how do we move it up earlier in the line of therapy that if you can have a potential cure sooner, uh, that you can actually have a better quality of life. And so we're really focused on improving what we have today, the risk-benefit profile, because today 43% of patients are living at five years. How do we make that better? While we do that, we're also working with external partners on the future. How do we actually bring the uh, therapy closer to the patient, um, whether that be an allo um, in existing platforms, or how do we actually transform beyond heme malignancies to solid tumors? Mm -hmm. Our focus internally is really on autologous cell therapy and on heme malignancies, and our external partnerships are focused more on the longer term um, play, which is in solid tumors and uh, the allo. We have some allo capabilities internally, but I think that collaboration and teamwork has to happen in the whole ecosystem for that to, to be true. And for some of you who may have saw um, the, one of the keynotes, uh, Chris McDonald, our head of manufacturing, uh, it is true we have almost 3,000 employees now, half of which are in the LA uh, area, and we are actually um, continuing to grow. We'll have over 2,000 uh, in California by the end of the year. Our El Segundo site, our number one um, technical operations facility started by these two gentlemen, actually is growing uh, the number of employees at, at a rate of 40 percent and our attrition rate year to date is one percent so we're trying to make sure that not only employees want to come but they want to stay and they're happy staying so um, that's enough about me I'll turn it over to Gina. Gina thank you Christy so I first like to introduce myself Gina Laporte I work for Genentech Roche and I had all of clinical development for the lymphoma pipeline 
So I'm one of the companies here that's not a CAR-T company, I'm a bispecific company. Uh, we do CD20 by CD3 bispecifics, and obviously CD20 is our target because that's, you know, we, Rituxan retux, is our drug, Gaziva is our drug, so we're trying to build upon our know-how and our success on CD20, and now we're in bispecifics. But we have at Genentech, we have a broad portfolio across not just lymphoma, but across all of hematology, oncology, also non-oncology, immunology, ophthalmology, cardiology. So we're trying to change the, I can speak for, for my therapeutic area, we're trying to change the lymphoma landscape with bispecific antibodies, and now we're gonna have a debate, like which is better, or can we coexist, bispecific antibodies versus CAR T cell? But we also have antibody drug conjugates like Polyvi and um, small molecules like Venetoclax. So we're trying to change the world in lymphoma, transform it, change the standard of care with both monotherapy and combination agents. I'd like to say one thing about myself, because maybe this will resonate with some of you. I know there's a lot of grad students here and people in academia. Uh, most of my career was in academia. I was at Stanford for 15 years in hematology and oncology. I left as a professor. I left at the peak of my career because I wanted to do something different. I felt like I had mastered something. I wanted to stay in, stay in a field that had impact and stay, stay in a field that made a difference, stay in a field that challenged me, and stay in a field that I know I'd work around really bright people. So I just want to let people know here who are in academia, you can still have an academic career, either come either short after training or stay a long time. I stayed in academia for 19 years. I left seven years ago, went into biotech and you know, worked scrappy and you know, wore many hats in biotech, learned how to raise money, learned how to talk to investors, used many muscles I never knew I had in academia. And now in big pharma, it's very different. There's um, the compar comparison and contrast is different, but I feel like I'm very lucky that I've had this um, scope of academia, biotech and big pharma. And I just wanna let people know who are thinking about either career, academia or biotech, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, when I was in academia, it was almost, a, it's changed now. I think it was like, oh, like kind of a strange, not, not maybe I'm gonna say it was a dirty word, like so bio, you know, pharma, biotech, you're going to the dark side. And it's not the dark side, I like to say, and because um, you think the, the pharma companies that are successful, the pharma companies successful obviously is measured by revenue. They only have revenue because they make good drugs and they make good drugs that change the lives of patients. So just remember that no matter which side you're on. <laughs> Thank you, Basil. Hi, I'm Basil Dahiad. I'm the CEO at Zencore. I helped uh, spin the company out of Caltech about 25 years ago as a graduate student, blindly um, spun out of Caltech and stumbled along for a lot of years. Um, it was to comment on the academia versus industry. When I did that, it was you know, insane to think you would leave academia. And I basically said, I've never been in academia. I was a student. I got my PhD. I'm done. And I was actually, they made fun of me when I came wearing a sport coat once back to campus to visit uh, the tech transfer office. So that's a, a memory deeply seared. We're a protein engineering company. We're a, a technology company that's applying that technology to build new therapeutics. So we try to stay on the bleeding edge of protein design. That's what we started out as, that's what we do today. And over the years, we've worked extremely hard to stay at that bleeding edge. And we've, as a result, had to constantly push the limits and develop new technologies, the technologies that that we created 15 years ago, some of them are now in marketed products, we're not working on those anymore. We're past that. And so that's, that's our place in the biotech ecosystem. We need to be at that bleeding edge. We currently have about 250 uh, folks working at Zencore, mm -hmm. and I like to think all of us are working on an experiment. Whether you're in the finance group, whether you're in HR, or whether you're at the bench, or whether you're you know, pulling clinical data out of a CRF from a site, the whole point of what we do is to do great experiments to try to make great drugs. So no matter what your job is and what you end up doing in this industry, you're gonna, you're gonna be supporting the science. And that's a way I tell myself I'm actually still a scientist. So, so the, the, the goal we have at Zencore is to not just bring drugs forward ourselves, we have a rich pipeline in clinical development, but also to work with partners. And that's the way we've supported ourselves through some of the lean times in the industry and being in kind of the, what used to be a backwater of Los Angeles. There's three marketed products that use our technologies <clears throat> from autoimmune disease to infectious disease to oncology. Our own pipeline is focused in oncology, both solid tumors and liquid tumors. Um, some of our partners announced data, like Amgen, our partner, announced data in prostate cancer, a solid tumor, using a CD3 bispecific molecule that we had built with them. We've got our own programs in solid tumors, as well as our partnership with Janssen for, for um, uh, CD20, CD3. 
So there's a lot of ways to build a company, and when you're forced to adapt, you do. And I, I want to encourage everybody in LA to consider staying here because I, I can't imagine a better time to be here in Los Angeles building a biotech company. So thanks. Thanks, Basil. I just want to warn everybody. Uh, David didn't come from Ukraine, from the war. Uh, he had surgery yesterday for repair of a meniscus. And I hope I asked the first question I asked him is we, if he uh, loaded on his hydrocodone before the, uh, the panel, he assured me that he's not. So uh, let's check. David. Yeah, you know, the problem is when you're taking medications like that, sometimes you don't know what you're taking. So <laughs> let's see how it goes. And before I do that, I'm just going to give a mm. shout out to my surgeon. Um, you know, Bert uh, Mendel, Mendel Baum at, From UCLA. Um, okay. at UCLA, yeah. who did a fantastic job. And uh, since I'm talking about it, you know, it's a meniscal tear. And he said, oh, yeah, you probably have to take the meniscus out. I said, okay, that sounds good. And, you know, you can walk in about a few days. So that sounded all good. And as I am in the operating table, he says, oh, you know what, we may have to repair it. Uh, so he successfully repaired it, and then today he tells me, today was my first op post-op uh, post visit, he tells me, uh, by the way, you are the oldest uh, person that I have ever done meniscal repair, and <laughs> at your age, had I taken the meniscus out, you are guaranteed to have a you know, knee replacement in about a year or two. So um, anyway, I'm lucky to have a good surgeon. So my name is David Chang. I'm the co-founder and currently president and CEO of Allergen. So Allergen is a company that was created with a singular purpose of bringing forth Allergen A CAR T therapy. And that really stems from the experience that I had with Ari at Kite Pharma, where I was the head of R&D, advancing the chimeric antigen receptor therapy. With the promise of a single infusion, essentially leading to a prolonged care of <clears throat> prolonged cure, essentially, prolonged control of the disease, and now I think people are talking about uh, cure more comfortably, especially based on uh, more than five years of follow-up of the uh, Yescada experience. I mean, that's really what drove the passion in me about, you know, exploring this area. And one thing that has taught us while developing, you know, what now is a Yescada at Kai Pharma, we realized that this, uh, the manufacturing, you know, for this potentially life-curing therapy to really have a place in the clinical care, it has to advance to the next level where the cell therapy is available as an off-the-shelf on-demand treatment, thereby making the treatment more widely available to patients, not just in the refractory setting, but also in the earlier line subsetting. And frankly, I would say this is a journey in my case that began in 2011. At that time, <clears throat> I was... Uh, leading the hematology oncology program at Amgen. And Amgen acquired a small company called Micromed in Germany, which was responsible for bringing forth what now is Splincido. That is a first T-cell engager, uh, CD19, CD3, by specific antibody. That experience taught me the power of redirecting T-cells uh, to the cancer. And I see as we are you know, sitting together with those who are developing bispecific as well as those who are developing autologous cell therapy and allogeneic cell therapy, this you know, I see more or less as a continuum of advancement in science. Uh, you know, what was a bispecific cell therapy, expanded to cell therapy, as that's going on, bispecifics now all have gone into second and third generation bispecifics with all the improvement. And I think this, uh, as somebody who grew up uh, being a scientist and being a physician, uh, this is really you know, the excitement of what's going on in the current biotechnology world, despite all the sort of you know, stock price issues that some of you may be aware. The innovation is what's really driving a lot of people, and at the end, you know, that's what's going to benefit the patients. And personally, um, I'm LA native. Uh, went to for those who are familiar with LA. Uh, went to um, Wilboro uh, Junior High and Fairfax High School. After some detour in elsewhere, I spent uh, next 25 years in LA Basin, and last four years since we're talking about LA, um, the company that I work in, Allergen, is uh, San Francisco based, but still with many employees who are LA based. Thank you, David.
so with that introduction, let's move just the first uh, topic that I wanted to uh, get a few of you uh, to uh, uh, comment on, and that's the growing ecosystem in Los Angeles uh, as a biotech hub. Uh, Christy, you are uh, creating here uh, the future of the uh, of uh, of Los Angeles in the space, uh, having uh, more employees than anyone at the Greater Los Angeles. You know, excluding uh, obviously Amgen, uh, and you came from uh, from a big pharma, you know, from uh, uh, Eli Lilly. Uh, so, uh, how do you find? Uh, Los Angeles as a hub for uh, biotech, and what are your plans and, and you know, impression? <clears throat> you know, it, it's uh, wonderful to be a part of it, and even um, uh, a responsibility, I'd, I'd say, uh, to your question about being, uh, we're the number one employer in LA in terms of healthcare employees. And so as we look at that, it's a grave responsibility for us as well to make sure that the community that we live in, we also participate in and, and have a positive impact. Uh, so. Part of it is the employment, growing our um, career, the employees' careers, making sure that we have diversity and inclusion, that they enjoy coming to work, they have fun at work, but very focused on the mission to cure. And I think that's what unites all of us in the passion that we have. Additionally, as we look at the LA and the surrounding areas, um, from a responsibility standpoint, I'm proud to say we just won the Santa Monica uh, Sustainability Grand Prix Award um, for all of our efforts on um, sustainability and green and energy and uh, with the environment. So that, along with the investments in the um, COVID, during COVID, we spent a million dollars in LA specifically, uh, helping those dealing with the devastating pandemic, uh, and continuous in our employee resource groups, making sure that we're a part of the solution um, with some of uh, the violence and things that happen in our community. On the scientific side, the luxury of having UCLA in our, our, our back door and also many other, you know, USC, some of the people that you've um, heard from, Caltech, uh, even as far you know, reaching as San Diego. We also have research facilities up in Foster City. Uh, so the whole California uh, landscape for us is kind of our playground mm -hmm. uh, in the area and the infrastructure which we want to continue to invest in and continue to partner with um, biotech to advance the science and have better outcomes for patients living with devastating diseases. So I saw that, uh, that uh, in 2026, you uh, are telling the market that you will produce uh, $2.1 billion. Are you going to produce it here? Or how much of that will be LA-based? How much will grow here? And how much will grow in uh, the East Coast or in Europe? Ah, great question. I didn't know we actually said we were going to have 2.1 billion. I'm going to have to see where that figure came from. But oh, yeah, I do uh, know that our goal is to it's treat public information. <laughs> uh, I guess that's my new expectation. Um, so you know, we do expect to, tr to treat. If we start with the, what we do for a living, is treat 25,000 patients commercially um, by 2025, which is a, a big responsibility. We've treated over 7,000 commercially. That doesn't include clinical trials. But as we look at that infrastructure, our home base is Santa Monica and El Segundo. Our number one cell factory, the one that is produced from day one, continues to be um, the highest capacity uh, manufacturing site that we have. We, we've expanded it, we improve it, uh, and, and we really um, um, put a lot of investment effort and resources into that site and into the home office in Santa Monica. We also have Oceanside. Some of the issues in the marketplace many of the cell therapy companies are dealing with is access to and reliability of uh, supply of viral vector. And we made the decision two years ago to go ahead and acquire that and bring that in-house in Ocean bring that in-house in Oceanside and be able to make sure that we're not beholden um, to any uh, disruptions uh, in the um, ecosystem externally. Because when you have a nascent technology like this, not everybody's as focused on it as you are. So I think having that end-to-end -end, uh, system is important. So most of the investment and in infrastructure will be in California. Uh, we're building a new research facility um, on the campus, on the Gilead campus in Foster City, trying to leverage that ecosystem uh, as well. So you talked earlier about uh, the San Francisco area. We're there, invested there. Obviously, our parent company, Gilead, is there here in El Segundo and Santa Monica and Oceanside. And then we have a site in Amsterdam that opened in June during the pandemic. It opened actually virtually with the regulatory authorities. And in Maryland, we just opened a site there um, as well so that we can actually um, you know, have enough capacity to produce um, for all of the patients uh, that need therapy from us. Thank you. Basil, you are on the east side of uh, Los Angeles. 
And I think you and I started more or less the first company in a year apart, which was 1996 or 1997, when yeah. I started agencies, you started, or, you know, Owen Weedy, uh, Jim McConnell, a, a group of uh, UCLA professors, thought that uh, we've never started a company, but let's, uh, let's try to do it, similar to what you have done. Very you much so. See one, do one, and now we're teaching one. You know how it is. <laughs> okay? Yeah, 1997, and it was really, like I said, a blind attempt at starting a company around a really cool technology idea. You can engineer proteins using a computer to help you. And we, um, we sort of had the benefit and the, the, the really challenges of LA back then. The benefit was the pool of scientific talent, and by that I mean truly scientific talent. Basic science talent in LA is, is second to none in the world. And I'm talking about whether it's you know, the people that are going to think about the concept of designing your protein to the people who are going to operate your lab. We have more Cal State employees than we have Caltech employees or UC employees. So the labor pool here is tremendous. We've always benefited from that. And that helped us achieve our, the core of our mission, which is always be at the bleeding edge of technology. And that was necessary to, frankly, keep us alive where there were no venture capitalists. We were always struggling to get attention from our potential industry partners and frankly, just literally find a building to put a lab in. All of those issues have significantly improved, not just in the last 25 years, but really in the last, I'd say, I don't know, six or seven years. The two major inflections that happened were, I would say, Amgen's maturation of what it's doing in Thousand Oaks and frankly, having a substantial multi-year reductions in force that have created a tremendous labor pool of people beyond the basic science, but in development sciences, in manufacturing, in quality and regulatory, in all of the things that are not teachable in a school. And so that's been a huge inflection. And the second inflection, which created a lot of attention and a, a, a deep and dynamic labor pool that you can hire in and out of, was the acquisition of, of Kite by Gilead. And so that's created a sea change in how the region is perceived externally, and that's brought in significant local investment interest, like your fund Vita Ventures. Um, and so the, the time is so different now. Um, if, if I knew what, it, what I knew now, if I knew then what I knew, know now, um, I don't know if I would have done it, honestly. But it, it, okay. it's, it's uh, Koki, you are, you are the closest to Amgen. Uh, are you benefiting from it? We, we totally do. And, um, it, it, <laughs> thank you. Um, we, we have a Don't probably, get too close to a kite. <laughs> <laughs> we have the most clinically advanced allogeneic uh, T cell program. And what that means really is the need for regulatory and uh, CMC excellence. We've had a lot of interactions with the agency. Uh, we're pretty excited. We think we're on track for uh, you know, uh, positive European opinion in Q4. And we think you know, working with the agency will find a path forward. So. Um, to your point, there's tremendous expertise, and, and cell therapy is more than just about discovery. It's really about getting to the finish line, getting those drugs to patients. So, okay, thanks. We can continue to debate that, uh, but you can you can get the message of uh, what's happening in LA, uh, and uh, let's uh, kind of move a little bit more excitement. I'm looking some excitement uh, debates and not agreeing. Everybody agrees on uh, which direction to take. Uh, Christy, you are doing autologous cell therapy. David, you are allogeneic cell therapy. And you have two representatives here of uh, bispecific. Uh, Christy, what's your take? How, how, how are you viewing that? And how are your people in the company coming to you said, hey, we shouldn't do uh, maybe cell therapy. Um, let's move to by specific. Do you have anybody that's saying that? Um, maybe my Gilead no. colleagues are working on that um, with all the investments they've had in, uh, in oncology, but we are, we are squarely focused in cell therapy. That's what we do, that's what our strength is, and that's what we'll continue to, to do. Um, and our goal, you know, um, I never thought in my lifetime I'd actually see a patient be given um, a choice of uh, six months to live, palliative care, or um, a, a chance to save their life in later lines. I mean, whoever, it's like um, science fiction. But now that we know that that's true, that patients, even in the later lines, at uh, the end of their rope, um, have a chance to 
survive is just a dream for everybody who's been touched by cancer to imagine the friend, family member that you lost that actually would be alive today had they had such a therapy for their whatever type of disease. So for us, it's a focus on the cure, absolute focus on the cure. How do we make sure that patients live the rest of their life um, if they can? Today, we only have two out of 10 patients that are getting it that are eligible. Out of 10 eligible patients, only two get it. So we talk about the science, which is great. You would think if you had a potential cure that people would be knocking down the doors. It is an extremely heavy lift to change the marketplace, to change the standard of care, even when you have the data. And so as we look at what our goal is, our number one goal at Kite right now mm -hmm. is to take the great science that has been proven and make sure that it gets to patients all across the globe uh, and to move it up into earlier lines of therapy so they have that hope sooner and to continue that piece. So that is our focus is our research and development, our clinical development, focus on autologous cell therapy and making it better, getting it to more patients. How do we translationally understand who's benefiting, who's not? How do we improve the um, uh, efficacy safety profile? And that is what we're, what we're focused on. You know, when I came three years ago, I was told that don't build your factory in Maryland, uh, Christy. Take your losses because allogeneic is going to just disrupt the marketplace. We want aloe to come out. We want that off the shelf. We want those easy to use therapies for patients so that it, it can make it that easier for them. Uh, but it has to also be curative intent. It has to be what's best for the patient um, and, and not what's easy. So you need both of those pieces. We know what's best, but we do need to make it easier. So we do want to partner. We do want to, on the external pieces, whether it's aloe, um, whether it's other therapies, combination therapies that help improve the efficacy, safety profile, we absolutely want to do that. But our sweet spot is to make sure that we get these proven therapies to patients, that we improve upon what is there, and that we partner for that longer-term approach. Approach. You know, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with uh, the recent uh, data of, uh, of uh, KITE, uh, KITE has created the highest bar in cell therapy of any company in the world. And that creates a problem for everyone who wants uh, to develop a drug. You have to do it at least as good or even better, but how can you exceed it? But what's most exciting, and maybe we want to hear from you, is real-world data. It's one thing that David Chang and his team uh, developed a plan of what and how are we going to test and bring to the FDA approval. That's great. We have selected patients. Uh, you know, there's a lot of criticism of clinical trials. However, uh, when you are going and the drug is approved, and now it's in the real world, and it needs to get feedback from the doctors and you start selecting the information, maybe you can talk about your study because it's the most impressive that I think, and the most difficult for many of you who want to start a company cell therapy, that's the new bar. <clears throat> Yeah, it is um, just wonderful data. As we look across the globe, um, bringing Zuma One, um, Ari and David's uh, um, brain, seeing that data uh, coming out of Zuma One, and then looking what happens in the real world, I've never seen in any therapeutic area I've been in real world evidence replicating the clinical trial data because it's not as well controlled, right? It's and you have different practitioners and you have different authorized treatment centers, etc. But what we're finding, and you know, if you saw any of the data at ASH, um, the French Register registry was one key um, piece of information, but we also have, not that we've made public, um, but uh, we have contracts in Europe with the, the countries um, to be able to prove the benefit and the cost. You have to track and, and follow patients and say, is the cost that you're, the government's paying worth it from a health economic standpoint? And we're finding time and time again that the real world evidence replicates the clinical trial data. Uh, and it just keeps um, pr reinforcing uh, cell therapy, which then does create that bar of making sure that whatever we do needs to be much better improved. And, and that's also um, critical for us at Kite. You know, when we were going through our strategy discussions in the last three to four months and we looked at some of the areas we're in or not in and some of the partnering that we can do, we are not interested in being the fourth BCMA multiple myeloma therapy to the market. If it's not going to be transformationally different in the marketplace, then I don't think it behooves us to be a part of it because we want to advance patient outcomes, um, not just be a, a part of the existing ones. Okay. Okay, David, if, if this is so good, what are you doing at uh, Allergy? Why, uh, why use Allogenate? No, it's not clear to me, actually. No. You know, I get, 
a lot of credit to uh, Christy, what Christy has done at Kite and what the Kite organization has done, you know, since, uh, you know, Gilead was, uh, Kite was acquired by Gilead. Um, it is uh, one of the unique experience that I personally had, you know, developing Escada. And I think some of the team from the Kite, maybe in the audience, uh, I saw will go uh, with the masks. It's hard to recognize, but, you know, what you have done is, you know, something that's really transformative in, in, in medicine. And when you ultimately think about what we are doing as a drug developer and also as a, a researcher, it's really, you know, goal is to change the outcome of the patients with cancer. And, you know, the, you know, Kite product has definitely done that. And that's what you get rewarded in the marketplace. But like anything else, innovation just continues. If you think about the early days of you know, the targeted therapy versus where the targeted therapies have evolved over the last 15, 20 years, it's at a totally different place. You know, trying to use targeted therapy you know, pretty broadly to nowadays, even if it's a 5, 10% of the population, you go after that population to get the maximum benefit out of the therapy. With a cell therapy, eventually, you know, that kind of innovations will continue. And some of the things that, you know, I think about and the team at, uh, at Allogen is thinking about, you know, is how to go from where we are right now to the next place where we can provide benefit to the patients and the caregivers. And the conclusion that we get is all the hassles, quote unquote, you know, technically it is managed, but it is some of the challenges of autologous cell therapy of individualized manufacturing. You know, going from there to a manufacturing that can serve hundreds, if not thousands of patients from each manufacturing, that allows multitude of different gene engineering, you know, which can make the CAR T cells even more potent than what you can do with simply introducing the chimeric antigen receptor into the cells. Not only that, the manufacturing play, uh, 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 process is simpler. Uh, we have built our own manufacturing facilities in the Bay Area, and our current estimate is a small manufacturing facility from a single clean room that we can produce up to about 20,000 doses. So when you think about that kind of innovation, you know, while maintaining the benefits that you can get from the autologous uh, cell therapy. You know, we view that to be transformative, and I think that ultimately will uh, change the, the, the landscape of how the cell therapy is given. And also, at the same time, we have to sort of view that while we're doing this, everybody else in the field, uh, the bispecific antibodies will continue to improve, autologous cell therapy manufacturing you know, therapies will also improve, and you know, there's a, you know, a bit of a friendly competition, but ultimately, this will serve the patients good. Thank you. Gina, uh, are you going back to tell your, uh, your, your supervisors that uh, you heard all the stories about Allogene and about, uh, about Kite, and what's your impression? Or you stay with where you are? <laughs> I think we're going to stay if where I we are. If I remember, you were a bone marrow transplanter before, right? <laughs> I think we're going to stay where we are, but we're always open to other options. And building on what David said, right, there's competition now. With, you know, Autocar T came first. Bispecifics will get approved sometime this year for lymphoma. Allocar T is right around the corner. As David said, the good news is there's a lot of patients who need this. So this only helps the patients, all this healthy competition. I don't know, I can't predict the future of what will one dominate and take the largest share of the market, I can't say, but this helps patients and it really depends where, I think what determines a patient's uh, treatment is not just their disease, but where are they, you know, where, what's their practice setting, are they in a big city, are they in the community, what's their doctor comfortable with, what's their caregiver situation. So I think there's room for all, I mean some, there's, some have pros, some have cons, you know, with, by specifics, again, we're off the shelf. It's traditional scalable manufacturing, but, and we can look at different targets. It's, you know, our th we are behind, but we're catching up very quickly. We don't have the durability data, that autocar T, but, but give us time. It's looking, it's looking good as far as response rates, and it's a friendly, healthy competition because the only people who win when there's this much competition 
are the patients, but we, we, but we are very well aware that cell therapy is, has a very enlarging foot, is a rapidly enlarging footprint in the world of lymphoma and lymphoid malignancies, which is what I look at. So we're keeping our eyes open on all, on all, all of these companies, and um, we'll, we'll see where we go. But you know, we're, we're not just limiting ourselves to what we're doing. We, we're always looking around. Gina, uh, in, uh, in the cell therapy, yes. it's a living cell. You give it once, and you're done. Yes. How is the latest? What is the latest in the bispecific? Do you have to give it continuously? How often? Mm -hmm. What are you doing that's okay. evolving? But yes. uh, how is it yeah, now? Yeah, it's a very good question. For our bispecific, we're not the only bispecific game in town, obviously. For our bispecific, bispecifics, we give fixed duration. It's not treatment until progression. We know some of our competitors, you know, pretty much all of our competitors go continuous until progression. So we think that's a large advantage. As far as hospitalization monitoring, uh, we did require you have more than one admission. It's, it's, it's going down the amount of monitoring that's needed. Uh, we don't need, once a patient gets discharged, they can go home. There's no close monitoring needed. So again, it really depends on the practice setting and the patient's support network and their caregiver situation. So again, it's not one size fits all. There. So we are we are making inroads as far as monitoring, as far as toxicity, and as far as um, again fixed duration. I mean, we, and we don't need um, a conditioning regimen before uh, our our type of technology. Basically, do you see a position with all the partnership that you have of combination, somewhat a combination of the two, or these are uh, mm -hmm. different modalities? I, I don't know about a combination of a T cell engaging by specific with a T cell or say an NK cell uh, cellular therapy. I, I think what I see is a, a segmentation of frontline early line treatment with later line treatments, not just in lymphoma where, where we're all starting because you know biotech is about go to the easiest place first. Lymphoma targets are the most restricted and easiest accessed of any targets in the body. And as we explore deeper into oncology, the challenges get greater and greater, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, head and neck cancer. I think that the place that I see bispecifics making a mark and these trials have already started is going into frontline. We're not trying to replace cell therapy, we're trying to replace chemotherapy. And we're trying to replace chemotherapy rituxin combinations in lymphoma, right? Right now about, what, 50% of large cell lymphoma patients are cured cured in frontline from rituxan chemo, maybe 80%, 75% of follicular lymphoma or more indolent lymphoma patients are cured, done, right, from a fixed duration course of treatment. And th those patients that are slipping through are going to the later lines of treatment and are now having these revolutionary therapies from, you know, uh, places like Kite. I think we want to move that number up. We want to go 80 to 90. We want to go 50 or 60 to 80 percent, right? So, so more and more people don't have to undergo later lines of therapy, really difficult regimens, really challenging and life disruptive regimens. And we want to get rid of the toxicities of chemotherapy. One of our, our studies going on right now, we have to start in late line because of safety issues and because of, of the, the, the sort of the ethics considerations. We're doing a combination of our CD20, CD3 bispecific with an antibody against CD19 with an immunostimulant agent, a, a lenalidomide, a Revlimid, right? So that kind of combination approach where you can meld mechanisms has been the mainstay of oncology now for decades, right? That's what bispecifics are gonna let us do so we can start moving all of these bars and make it harder and harder for any therapy because that's better and better for patients. So that's how I see bispecifics having an impact. We imagine bispecifics in prostate cancer being combined with androgen deprivation therapy. We can imagine it being combined with, and we're doing this right now, with salvage chemo, right? And so we have to think really broadly about how we're approaching oncology. And I, I would also say that the first approved by specific in America was Blincito in lymphoma. The second was Hemlibra in, of all diseases, hemophilia, right? The third was a MET EGFR dual blocker for lung cancer, right? And so this is just a modality that can be used anywhere. And, you know, immuno-oncology is an incredibly important application, but creating these new tools is, is going to have a far broader reach. I note that, you know, Koki, your company is in multiple sclerosis right. yeah. with this cell therapy. So I, I don't want to necessarily just focus on that. But within the space of oncology, I think the way biospecifics play is it's a drug like 
physicians like you know Gina and, and David and you are used to pulling out of a vial and using in a myriad of ways you physicians are so creative. That's a very good point uh, about the non-oncologic indication, which is a whole topic, other topic that I don't know if we'll have time to discuss. We didn't get enough time for that, so next year maybe. But uh, this year, uh, you know, the whole focus here, as you heard, is oncology. But now, the amount of, uh, the number of companies that are emerging in non-oncologic in, uh, indication, in uh, autoimmune disease, uh, we just started a company now, uh, cardiac CAR T uh, against fibrosis. Uh, I mean, this is just imagination is going beyond uh, uh, anyone's, uh, uh, anyone's uh, kind of dream uh, before. But uh, let's move on to uh, a little bit of the manufacturing because that's kind of the bottleneck right now, manufacturing and partnership. Uh, there are now around 630 uh, cell therapy companies uh, in the world, 630 companies. Every one of the 629 believes that it can be better than Kite. <laughs> uh, and they might be right, but what you heard is manufacturing of being, controlling your own destiny. Uh, each one cannot build a manufacturing plan for himself. Uh, so you have to be uh, innovative. Koki, uh, you have recently been quite uh, innovative with Fujifilm, That's right. with the work that you have done with uh, Atara, yeah. which actually has two purposes, as I understand. Maybe you can describe how you decided, what you decided to convert your manufacturing to something else. Thank you, Ari. Yeah, um, we, we chose a different path and it maybe suits Atara, but also the fact that we're allogeneic. We, we, we get our T-cells from uh, healthy human donors and what we realized is that we don't need this continuous manufacturing. So what, for what worked for us was we have this process science is excellence um, and we lock the process and then we can rely on a, a world-class partner like Fuji really for the manufacturing needs. And really that fits the scale of Atara so that we have you know, banks and banks of off-the-shelf cell therapies uh, for EBV lymphomas and uh, MS. And um, you know, the, the other benefit in this horrible public market is that it's non-dilutive capital, so. Um, You're the first one who just said that the market is not good. I did not hear <laughs> it from anybody here that the market in biotech is not good. You know, that's the difference. If we would have it in New York, in a minute, the first we're sitting said, hey, everything has changed in the last uh, three months, which they are right, but here, everybody talks about science, and that's the beauty about it. So uh, let's enjoy it as, as long as we can. Okay, uh, maybe you can talk also about uh, the big partnership. You had with Bayer, and right. you know that was disclosed that the Bayer uh, yeah. study uh, created some issues with the med mesothelin uh, CAR T. Sure. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Sure, I, I, I can talk about that. And you know, I think partnerships are important to any biotech, and we have a partnership with Pierre Fabre for um, our lead program, Tabcell, um, <clears throat> and uh, we have uh, obviously a a partnership with Bayer, um, and, and unlike, you know, you know, like most partnerships, they, they kind of have a natural progression, and I think um, it's been a, a hugely important partnership for us because Bayer's investment in our CAR-T platform has really helped us get it to this point where we can move into scale and do stirred tank um, bioproduction to, to the same scale that David was talking about. Um, you know, I think on the mesothelin, that was an unfortunate incident, that was an auto CAR-T uh, program that that program is run by Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, it's called 2271. Um, it's an unfortunate grade five incident um, that was reported in February from Memorial Sloan Kettering to the FDA. Um, the autopsy is still being finalized, Ari. Um, and so the, the natural course here is that Memorial will report the final autopsy um, results to the agency um, and then before the, the trial can resume. For, from our standpoint, um, looking at the data, we don't believe that it's CAR-T related. So, you know, we have confidence in the program. Um, so. But that shows you uh, what's the big brother, the big pharma, yeah. uh, how they're looking at it. That's so right. it used to be, uh, no, uh, Kite had its own share in the early days. Uh, David had some sleepless night when some patient died, but we had to report to the FDA and that's it. Uh, and the investors, yeah. but, um, but today, 
market has changed. Uh, with that, partnerships are between pharma and biotech. And the big pharma is not going to buy you immediately. They want to date you first. Yeah. Uh, let's date, let's see who you are, several years, we'll feel, uh, we feel good about each other, and then we'll take it to the next level. But there is the risk, and here is that. The next, the next day you get a, uh, a uh, notification that Bayer has changed his whole strategy and the board of directors, and they, have, they are pulling out. That's, so this is part of uh, partnerships with uh, the big pharma, and it can be fantastic, uh, and, but at the same time, a little bit uh, risky. Uh, David, manufacturing. Uh, you have invested uh, more than, I think, 99% of all the 630 uh, uh, companies uh, in manufacturing. Uh, what, uh, what do you think? Uh, when it comes to cell therapy, at least our position at Allergen is manufacturing is the key. When we talk about manufacturing, it's not the final step of producing the cells, but it starts with, you know, what is the plan? You know, what kind of engineering do you intend to do? Is it a simple retroviral transduction? Do you involve gene editing? Do you involve site-specific integration of specific genes? And if you do that, how many genes do you want to do? Ultimately, where we are trying to get to is take the learnings from the biology and essentially uh, work out the concept of synthetic biology, making the CAR T cells to do exactly what you want to do, what, what you want it to do. And in, in this case is trying to, you know, with a single infusion, getting close to a cure. I mean, that is the ultimate direction of the allogeneic CAR T therapy. And I think we are in a pretty good path to get there. Whether it's gonna take one to two years, three to five years, we can debate about it, but the direction is clearly laid out. So from that sense, controlling the design of the construct, developing the process, and for those who may be familiar with manufacturing, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done on the analytic characterization of the process products uh, during the manufacturing process as well as final product. So, so from our perspective, it is a manufacturing so. is a key and uh, investing heavily in the manufacturing is what's going to differentiate the CAR T companies or any cell therapy companies to those who have it to those who do not. So why not work with CDMO? You know, maybe in another 10 years, the CDMOs will have enough expertise. Right now, I do not believe that CDMOs have the kind of expertise that's really required to innovate in this field. So uh, until that becomes more widely available technology, I think each company that's working on the cell therapy has to take the ownership of the manufacturing. Well, we are uh, unfortunately just two minutes away from uh, closing, so maybe we get, in five years from now, what are we going to do? By specific, we're doing autologous, allogeneic. Uh, what, how, how do you see the, the market in five years, Koki? Um, I, I have a wholehearted belief in off-the-shelf allogeneic cell therapy. Off-the-shelf? Yeah. Why not in vivo? In vivo CAR T? Um, I, I think that's, that's, that it's would not be, in five years. No, I not in five years. Yeah. Five to 10. Good. So, you know, um, looking at the journey in the last three years, if I, if I project out to five years, um, I think if we're looking at 10 years, it's a whole different answer, but just in five years, uh, I think Allo will come. It won't be the disruptive technology um, with the first generation. It won't match the autologous um, piece, but there'll be a place for it because of the logistics and travel that it takes with autologous. So there'll be a place, but not t uh, totally disruptive to the marketplace. I think um, in the course of those five years, each of the, whether it's bispecifics, autologous, Allo, the evidence is um, in their clinical trials. And to our point about real world evidence, the real world evidence is gonna have to capture for us what is the right sequence if you use a bispecific first, are you actually reducing the efficacy of cell therapy later? If you use a cell therapy first, are you actually increasing the chances for survival longer term and then use the others later? So the sequence of those events, I think, re only real-world evidence will tell us, and we'll know more about that in five years. Gina. I agree with Christy. It's a sequencing. I think everything, all three auto, allo, car team, bispecifics will be 
available. Um, sequencing depends on, again, I think, is there T-cell exhaustion, depending if you use one versus the other. But me being a bispecific company in person, I think bispecifics will definitely be there. Will they dominate? I th I'm, I'm hoping that they 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 do dominate from my from my perspective, but they won't be the only one in town, and you know we're off the shelf. And we don't have the durability. I admit that we don't have the durability that AutoCAR T does, but um, we have the high response rates, and only time will tell. And I think you know, da data will speak for itself. Thank you. Basil. I think in five years, you're going to have multiple approved bispecific antibodies in first line lymphoma and um, probably creeping up to maybe second line myeloma. And how those are going to play in the, in the sort of market, I don't know. Um, but that's going to be a theme that plays out across oncology. You're going to have your first, I'm betting small cell and prostate cancer are going to have their first bispecifics also approved within about five years, probably accelerated approvals that you can then build on. So I see the field of immuno-oncology really broadening targeted immuno-oncology outside of lymphoma because of these new tools that we have. We didn't even talk about cell, about solid tumors, which is completely different, but David, five years. Okay, being the last person, I'm going to be a little bit more provocative. I think in five years, I do agree there will be a mix of bispecifics, autologous, and allogeneic. And at this point, as Christy said, you know, within five years, there will be allogeneic cell product that will be in the market. I'm going to extend the time period by another five years. When you have the off-the-shelf, one-time treatment that can potentially provide a cure, uh, as a physician, you know, I just don't see any other you know, outcome other than allogeneic CAR-T will eat the Otalis CAR-T therapy alive. I'm sorry, Christy, but it will <laughs> That's happen. That's okay. We'll be a part of it together. Yeah. I wanted it in the beginning. What's yeah, but the I want to be provocative. I'm the last one to go. Now it's time and, to be, can and, we extend another half hour? <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, by the same token, you know, the one-time aspect and off-the-shelf aspect will just provide, you know, will be such a significant challenge to the bispecifics as well. So, Gina and Basil, I know we have had these debates before, but I think the outcome is still the same. The allogeneic CAR-T therapy will prevail. <laughs> I see you are in, on hydrocodone right now. <laughs> okay, uh, in closing, I just want to remind everybody, cell therapy that you heard here all started from academia. It was not invented in any pharmaceutical company. Uh, we had to convince hard and, and, and in a difficult way, uh, the industry to get there. Uh, legend of the industry that we talked with them, uh, that created Merck and other companies when uh, we had lunch with them, and we said, would you have believed that cell therapy will become a mainstream of medical oncology? They said, absolutely not, never. But this is the basic research that all started from universities and transformed uh, to, uh, to the mainstream uh, clinic and pharmaceutical. So with that, thank you so much. I want to uh, uh, thank the panel, exactly, uh, amazing uh, group, and um, see you next year. <laughs>